something to say. Hello everybody, how are you doing today? My name's Charlie, and welcome to this episode of Project Shadow. Um, yeah, sorry for not having an episode out tomorrow and for this one being late. Um, having an episode out tomorrow, having an episode out yesterday. Okay, so I'm not going to go into detail, but yesterday was a lot of family stuff, and everybody's fine, I think. Um, but yeah, it was a thing. And I'm still a little bit shaken up, so, um, <laughs> sorry. Anywho, today I have an episode I want to do that is something that I've been thinking about for a while, and then Lindsay Ellis on her YouTube channel did a video on the death of the author and brought all of the ideas up and flooded my mind and so, yeah, I'm going to do an episode today on the death of the author, mainly because I am an author <laughs> and I don't know if I matter anymore. No, that's not true. But over the years, I have kind of watched what has happened with the nature of the relationship between author and fan, and I'm a little concerned about what the future looks like. And okay, so if you've never heard of Death of the Author, Death of an, uh, the idea, the, I don't know, analytical scheme of Death of the Author as conceived of by Roland Barthes and elaborated on by a lot of other writers, such as Foucault and others, is basically the idea that authorial intent doesn't matter. Once a work is written, all that matters is the text and the person reading the text and their relationship to it pretty much that's the basic idea and i highly recommend that you watch lindsay ellis's video on this because it takes a very interesting twist in that she brings john green into it and literally brings john green into it because of the metatextual relationship that he has with his works because he's john green and he has a very popular youtube channel and podcasts and all those things where he's very well known and how that informs the relationship between his readers and his texts. And it was a really very interesting thing to watch. And I, I, I can't recommend the video enough. I mean, if you're not watching Lindsay Ellis on YouTube, you, you need to be watching Lindsay Ellis on YouTube. But my, my concerns come in as a writer in that my... Okay, so I, I personally believe that headcanon is a thing. I have a lot of headcanons myself. I'm a fan of a lot of things myself. And I license all of my work under a Creative Commons license so that, you know, anybody can write derivative works, not for profit, because I want to kind of can use that as a canon line. Is, But I also feel like if I read something that was amazing and really good or if something really became prominent i would contact that author and try to bring it up into the canon level and find a way for them to make money off of it but um that's a whole topic for another day i've actually written a lot of posts about that over at project shadow about fan economy economies so if you want to check that out you can um no, my, my biggest concern with all this is how and why I got into writing and the modern discourse and not so much about the theory of death of the author, but where I hear it evoked most commonly. See, I fell in love with creativity through the work of world builders. And this is where like honesty comes in. The first world I honestly fell absolutely head over heels in love with was Tracy Hickman and Margaret Weiss's um, Dragonland series. I just absolutely fell in love with the books, with the game, 
Like it, it was a big part of my childhood. And of course, then I discovered the works of J.R.R. Tolkien and um, Robert E. Howard. Oh, Robert E. Howard is an, it influenced a lot of my writing and Frank Herbert. Oh, and what I desired when I started writing from the very first project that I ever did when I was a kid was to build and develop a world and then to tell stories in that world. And so I still have some of the notebooks from the first world that I ever created. And I was doing conlangs and, you know, histories and all that. And I actually wrote an, well, I wrote technically two novels in that setting. One has been lost to time because I wrote it on a computer and I cannot remember the software that I used. And I don't think the disc is readable anymore. The other one I hand wrote, um, and I still have that, and it's sheer and utter crap. But, you know, it's one of those books that you have to get out of your system because you're learning. And when it comes to my relationship with my own writing, this is where my concerns come in. Because some of the biggest backlashes that I've seen throughout my life are when writers, creators, what have you, do something with a property that people are not happy with. You know, I talk about this all the time with, you know, my experience with the Alien franchise. I love the first two Alien movies. I think the third one is not very good. The fourth one I actually enjoy a, a bit. Then Prometheus was terrible and Covenant. Uh, I, I think I might grow to be able to watch Covenant in a way that's not just with great sorrow. But I accept that series as it is because, well, at least when it comes to Prometheus and Covenant, Ridley Scott, who did the original, came back and did those new editions. And they're not editions that I wanted. They're not editions that I would have seen coming in the text. But this is where my view of authorial intent matters. Ridley Scott created the first Alien movie. He is kind of the father of the aliens. And as much as any one person can be, because, you know the xenomorphs in that entire story was conceived by a large group of people. You know, H.R. Giger being, you know, most prominent in that. But I, I, I kind of allow myself just to go with the flow and see what's happening. Because I know that this is Hollywood and eventually there will be a reboot. You know, I see a very different reaction in my sisters and brothers who are Star Wars fans. And I saw it right from the get-go. When George Lucas decided to do the prequel trilogy, which I think is unfairly maligned, I do not think it is perfect. I do not think it is one of the best things ever, though it has some of the best Star Wars moments ever. And anybody who wants to doubt that, the pod race scene in episode, episode one has the pod race scene and the duel with Darth Maul at the end, which are two of the greatest scenes in Star Wars history. And we can quibble about the plot all day long, but... And no, I'm not the hugest fan of the plot, but y you have to admit the pod race scene and the duel with Darth Maul are two of the coolest things that have ever been done in Star Wars. Having said that, it's... See, this is where I get weird. George Lucas wanted that movie. He wrote it, he directed it, and he sat in the editing room making sure it came out exactly the way he wanted it to, to. You see... Episodes 4, 5, and 6, episode 4 is the way it is because his wife at the time went through and edited his movie down to make that movie. Maybe, and we can talk about all day long how he should have been, you know, brought in an editor to do the same kind of work for the prequel movies, but 
the one thing that we cannot ever challenge when it comes to the prequels is that those are the movies that George Lucas intended them to be. Whether or not they're the movies any of us wanted or liked or what have you, none of that is relevant to the discussion I'm having right now. And that is intent of the author. George Lucas created Star Wars. He made the first six movies. Granted, Empire Strikes Back, he did with Lawrence Kasdan, and I think Lawrence Kasdan also wrote on um, Return of the Jedi. I may be wrong about that. But, you know, he worked with others for Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. But it, he is the creator behind this. And if for everybody who wants to say that there's no way that he intended any of the stuff in the prequel trilogy from the beginning, Marvel Comics actually turned one of the earliest drafts of the Star Wars script into a comic book series, and it's called The Star Wars. What, read that book. Or get your hands on the script. Either way, um, with Marvel Unlimited and comics being very easily available, I think it might be easier to read the comic book than to find one of the early draft scripts. But it reads like the prequels, much more like the prequels than the, the original trilogy. So, again, when it comes to authorial intent, you cannot like his intent. But the one thing that you cannot deny is that episodes 1, 2, and 3 are the way that he wanted them to be. And I bring that up in our discussion of Death of the Author because the first time I ever heard the phrase Death of the Author was when I was talking to somebody about the prequel trilogy. And this is when the movies were still coming out. I think it was uh, Attack of the Clones, I think had just come out. And I made the argument that I am very prone to making that, well, he created the series and this is where he wanted it to go. You know, like, like it or lump it, this is what he wanted. And somebody brought up to me this idea of the death of the author and that, well, it doesn't really matter what he wants. It matters what we see. Okay. And I'm not going to debate the merits of, you know, somebody's personal relationship with a text. What I am concerned about with all of this is that an author, a creator, is more or less, apparently, expected to focus group their work with the audience that's reading it or watching it or what have you. Because that seems to have been every time I've ever discussed Star Wars or the Wizarding World of J.K. Rowling with someone who invokes Death of the Author. There seems to be this idea that, well, Rowling should have, you know, asked us. And I'm not entirely against that idea. But again, it, it's her world. Just as much as it is, it was George Lucas's world. And whether you like or dislike the way those went, if it wasn't for the prequels, we wouldn't have gotten the Clone Wars, which is probably the best Star Wars has ever been, to be honest. And if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have gotten Rebels, and we wouldn't have gotten The Last Jedi, which I will fight on this, is probably the best. If It's top two. I'm not sure if it's the best Star Wars movie, but it's top two. It's up there. At least for me. But I see what Ryan Johnson was going for, and it excites me because it completely opens up Star Wars going forward, which was the point of it. Disney wants to make this into a franchise like the Marvel franchise, where it can do whatever they want with it. And for the first time, they've broken free of the Skywalker lineage, and they will be able to do whatever they want. And they own the copyright, and they have the right to do that. We, as fans, have the right to feel however we want to. I mean, my feelings about the J.J. Abrams Star Trek shows are very plain for everyone to see, and my feelings about Star Trek Discovery, for that matter. But that doesn't 
change the nature of the authorial relationship with their own work. And in a lot of ways, I think Rowling and um, Lucas are the only two that are really important for us to talk about here because they had 100% control over their work. Like an author kind of sort of does. So I'm going to leave you with that and we'll come back and discuss this a little bit more after the break. And we're back. Okay, so when I, before the break, I was bringing up how when having the discussion I'm trying to have in my own head with you, that the only people worth bringing into the discussion are people like Frank Herbert or George Lucas or J.K. Rowling or J.R. Tolkien, who had complete control over their work and their worlds. And the reason I bring that up is because mainly because I have a lot of concerns about my own writing and my own relationship with my readers, because I have a lot of ideas about where I want the world to go. Go, I am writing stuff for ashdancer.com to explain more of the history and the setting that the books just would be boring and bogged down if I took time to go into that in the books itself. And that's where this becomes, you know, strangely bizarre for me. The line between text and meta text for everything I think is blurred now. Because really, the, the question that we have to ask ourselves when we're having the modern conversation between text and meta text and how much the author gets to insert their views over how the canon of a certain particular work is interpreted. Well, during his lifetime, the Silmarillion was never published. Neither were the Lost Tales or any of the other books that came out. Christopher Tolkien, his son, went through his father's expansive library of work on Middle-earth, collated and edited those works together. So, is the Silmarillion canon, or is it metatext? So what is metatext? Metatext is, you know, the things that the author says about their work. It's uh, J.K. Rowling's interviews and Twitter account. It's the interviews that Anne Rice does about her vampire books and what have you. It's the statements an author makes about their work that's not found within the work itself. And there's a lot more that goes into metatext, but for sake of our discussion here, I'm going to limit it just to that idea. So, is the Silmarillion metatext or is it text? Well, thanks to Christopher Tolkien, we all get to read the Silmarillion. We get to read the Lost Tales. But there's no evidence that Tolkien ever intended us to read those things. In fact, the only thing other than what we he published in his life that he had originally intended for us to read was a, a sequel series to The Lord of the Rings, which I believe was going to be called The Last Shadow, that he ended up scrapping because he felt that it detracted from the victory at the end of Lord of the Rings. But we have some of his notes as to what would have happened next, and it was not a happy, shiny world for the people who inherited it after Sauron's death. Do we take that into account when we look at his work? I think the same is true for J.K. Rowling. And I say that because we know from interviews that she's done since the books originally came out, and she's shown them. She has binders and binders of notes and stuff that she's done. I remember an interview that she did, I believe, when Prisoner of Azkaban came out, where she was showing family trees for a lot of the characters. So that was something that she had given a lot of thought to, and we didn't understand how that mattered at the time until, of course, you know, you start seeing how, you know, Sirius and Bellatrix are related, and Narcissa Malfoy, and, you know, and that actually did play 
into the story going forward, but it was something that she had thought about and had written down. So that library of unpublished Harry Potter content does exist. And I take her at her word that when she reveals something in answer to a question or whatnot, there, there's a chance that it is actually in one of those notebooks somewhere. Just because I know I've got binders and binders of notes that I've taken on stuff that I've written. But I think it's fair to say that anything that she says in any of those tweets or interviews is definitely meta text and not part of technical canon. It is may it may be her ethereal intent, but it is not part of the text. But J.K. Rowling confuses the topic even further because we have Pottermore. Oh, well, we have the history of Ilvamorny on there, and the history of magic in the United States, and a lot about various characters and magical things. Well, she's approved all that. It is text. Is it canonical text or is it meta text? What is StarWars.com's data bank? Is that text or is that meta text? Because the same company that controls the copyright for Star Wars runs the website. And the same thing for what I'm doing. You know, I'm building up ashdancer.com to go along with the books that I'm writing. Is that website text or meta text? Is that part of canon? And that may this may all seem like a strange side topic when we're talking about how things should or could be interpreted. But I think it's a for me at least, it is a lot more about how the story is told. When I look at the website and the things that I can do with the website, and I think of Roland Barth's idea of the readerly text and the writerly text, the idea that you could lay up enough clues and construct a narrative that it doesn't matter where a reader enters or leaves, they can construct their own story as they go. That's one of the guiding principles that I've been using in building the website. So to me, all of the content that I'm building for the website is part of the text, not the meta text. While it, and none of it is required reading. The Mask of the Gods series, which is going to be coming out this year, is one set of books that takes place in the world of the Ash Dancer. The House of Blood and Flames books will also take place in the same world. There may or may not ever be overlap between characters or settings in those books. That doesn't mean that they don't take place in the same world, and thus the stories will impact each other, because anything that happens relating to magic in the Mask of the Gods series, well, that's setting up how magic will be able to be used in the House of Blood and Flames books, and vice versa. So it's all interconnected, but on top of that, you know, I have a lot of stuff that I've written that I haven't put up on the website yet that explains how magic works and how the, the history of various cultures and societies throughout the world. And I'm going to be putting those up on the website. To me, they are as much text as the novels that I'm putting out, though they're not required reading. And I guess that's kind of the question that I'm getting to in this episode, because it's something that used to come out a lot prior to Disney buying Star Wars, when I would discuss Star Wars with someone, because I was one of the people who read the books. I read the books, I read the comics, which there weren't as many comics back then, but, you know, I did read what there was, <laughs> you know, because I love Star Wars, and that's the that was the place for new Star Wars. And we debated exactly what Star Wars fandom meant because, you know, not only had I seen the movies, but I was watching Clone Wars at the time. I was reading the Extended Universe, and I believe the Legacy of the Force books were coming out at that point, which are amazing books that I kind of wish the sequel trilogy were based on until Last Jedi happened, and I was like, oh, wow, okay, this is better. 
Um, yes, I'm willing to fight on that. But, you know, what made a Star Wars fan? And to me, it was just love of the story. But we would get into arguments because they would start speculating about something. And I would be able to point to an episode of Clone Wars, for example, and say, oh, they actually answered that, and it's blah, 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 blah. Well, that's not canon. Well, why is that not canon? Because that's not part of the TV show. Well, but George is doing it. You know, I had a simple rule. Canon was anything that George did. If George did it, it's canon. And it seems to kind of be the rule that Disney used when they established the new canon. The books fell away, but Clone Wars stayed. So, you know, anything George did was canon. And we would have profound arguments about this because they would say things like, well, I can't be expected to watch every episode of every show. And no, I don't think that that's true. I, I don't think that anyone has to watch or read everything Star Wars to be a Star Wars fan. I have a hard time keeping up with the comics. And even though I do read them, I read them through Marvel Unlimited, so I'm six months behind on my comic book reading. But I'm okay with that because, you know, it's, it's a it works for me. You know, some people want to be right on it, and they read, you know, as they're coming out. But you don't have to read all the comics and watch all the TV shows and read all the books. And and I don't think you definitely have to love everything to be a fan of something. But my biggest question is, and this is something that they bring up a lot in the Lindsay Ellis video, in the world that we live in now, with text and meta text and the entire problem of the branded author, you know, people like me who you can't get away from my thoughts because I do a podcast and I'm on Twitter and I'm on Facebook and if I never get my act together, I'll be on Instagram more, but <laughs> that requires me actually doing stuff over there. You know, we... It is impossible to read our text in some ways without experiencing it with a bias that comes from what we have said about it, around it, surrounding it, what have you. And I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. You know, when I say my biggest concern is my relationship to my fans and to my readers, it's not so much that I will write a book that upsets them about how they perceive a world that I'm writing in because, well, these really are my worlds and I, I write them the way they want to be written. And I feel much more like a steward of them because I will be in the midst of writing and go completely off outline because a better idea happens at the time of writing. So, you know, it is, for me at least, the stories really wanting to be what they are. And so, you know, people either like them or they don't like them. And I've gotten to a place in my own psychological makeup where I'm as all right with that as a <laughs> narcissistic writer can possibly be. Because, let's face it, all writers have at least a touch of narcissism or we wouldn't be writing. But... I don't want to be in a place where I'm having that argument that I've had in Star Wars with the readers of my own stories. And as you can tell with this episode and with a lot of the episodes of Project Shadow, I don't have an answer here. I have a lot of questions. And I think it's important for us as fans of various works and creators of various works to ask these questions and to figure out what our answers are because like i said what is pottermore is pottermore canon i mean jk rowling did it does it matter is canon even something we should be talking about anymore or not because i know for me at least with my star trek can you know head canon when I think of why the Klingons look so different in the original series compared to everything else, there was an explanation in the books that they were genetic fusions that were created to infiltrate 
the Federation, like you see in the episode uh, um, Trouble with Tribbles. And so in that book, we actually see Klingon Vulcan fusions and others because this was their way of infiltrating and also keeping people off guard and not knowing what an actual Klingon looked like. And Canon has diverged from that on a few places and a few points. And yeah. But in my head, usually when I think about it, that's, that's the answer that comes up. Because that's someone that meant something to me. So, I don't know. I, I wish I had firm answers on these questions. And I would probably be doing better episodes if I did. Well, I actually would probably be doing worse because it's not my place to tell you what's right and wrong. It's my place to ask questions and to hopefully get you asking questions so that we can come to some kind of consensus. On that note, if you have ideas about this or any other topic, I would love to hear from you. Please follow me on the Anchor app at anchor.fm. Just go download the app to your phone, follow Project Shadow. And you'll see a little button that says voice message. If you click that, you can send me up to a one minute message. Keep it clean. And I'll use it on the show. It could be a question, a comment, or a topic you'd like me to discuss on the show. Especially on a topic like this, I would really love to hear from you guys. I think that that would be really cool. Because I think it's a big question. At least in some, at least in the circles that I tend to uh, be in. If you've enjoyed this episode. I'm glad. This is something that's been kind of weighing on me for a while and I didn't know how to approach it. And then when I watched that Lindsay Ellis video, it gave me an idea of how to possibly approach the topic. If the app that you're listening to me on allows you to like the episode or the series, please do that. That tells the algorithm to share me with other people. And that really does help me out a lot. If you've got a buck or two you can throw my way, depending on the app, there'll either be a link that says a button that says support or a link in the show notes that says support on Anchor. If you click that, you can support me at the $1, $5, $10 a month levels. That helps me to keep these shows coming to you. And I want to say thank you to everybody who has supported me over the years. I was just able to get a copy of Vellum to make the ebooks look even better. So, and the actual print books. So, thank you for helping me be able to do that. And I'll be getting a copy of Worldographer so I can make some nifty maps for you guys. So thank you to everybody who's been supporting. You're making everything better for all of us. If you don't have a dollar you can throw my way, that's all right. I understand that. Trust me. I understand money being tight. Please share the podcast with people that you think will enjoy it. That helps out a ton as well. Everything that I do, you can find links to it at projectshadow.com. And until next time, don't forget, have the fun. Bye.